Thank you very much. We have a final discussion session in the evening, so we can make it again. I'm happy to say that uh, Mr. Kanterian is here, and uh, I give him the floor. Yes, thank you very much. I have a handout um, which consists of a photocopy of a page um, of Kuliano's book, The Tree of Noses. But uh, before I get to that, just uh, quickly as an introduction, uh, what is my relation to Kuliano? Well, I'm not at all an expert in the history of religions or agnosticism. In fact, at best, I'm a total amateur. Uh, I have read many, many books by Kuliano and by Eliade. Eliade is a hobby and for biographical reasons. And um, what I would like to, do, to try to do is to present a certain theory by him, the so-called theory of morphodynamics, and then um, give, offer some critical remarks. Um, now, yesterday was 20 years since Kuliano was uh, very nastily murdered uh, at the University of Chicago, and I much, much have admired Kuliano and his works and the person, and I still do. However, I have recently come to share a certain attitude to him, which uh, Immanuel Kant shared to uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which is, and I'm quoting Kant on Rousseau, I have read Rousseau for, I had to read Rousseau for as long as it was necessary to see below the beauty of his prose and get to the actual truth content of his arguments. So something similar I would like to do with Kuliano. Now, I can obviously not discuss his uh, doctrines concerning uh, the history of religions or uh, Gnosticism in particular. I can, however, test his philosophical propositions upon the truth and the logical consistency. Now, I have personally an interest in the philosophy of social science, in the philosophy of history and the philosophy of mind. And fortunately for me, Kuliano touches upon all these topics in many of his works, in fact, especially in his last works, such as The Eliade Guide to the World of Religions, Out of This World, both published in 1991, The Tree of Gnosis, published posthumously in 1992, and also in various uh, research articles, such as System and History from 1990 and Magic and Cognition from 1991. These works deal with various specific topics in the history of religions, but in the prefaces, preliminary chapters, and conclusions, especially of the books, Culliano develops a very general theory of breathtaking ambitions about nothing less than the nature of history and the human mind, which he calls morphodynamics. I shall focus here on the posthumously published The Tree of Gnosis, the most up-to-date articulation of this theory of morphodynamics especially the foreword and the introduction and the chapter 10, the tree of noses and the epilogue games people play. And I will reduce Kuliano's theory to the bare essentials and keep my own discussion only focused on these. All right, so let's look at morphodynamics. First of all, Kuliano expresses in this book a fourfold general claim. Number one, to give a precise scientific definition of history. Second, to integrate this definition into a general account of the human mind. Third, to apply this account of the human mind to all intellectual human enterprises, including religion, but also literature, science, and even philosophy. And, uh, of course, then, his analysis of the Gnostic currents and doctrines is only one such application and illustration of his very general account of history and the mind. And fourth, given the specific computationalist account of history and the mind he offers us, he wants to predict history. For example, to predict the future development of intellectual human enterprises. Now, from all these uh, four aims, he achieves aim one and two in the Tree of Gnosis, to give a precise scientific definition of history and, <coughs> and of the human mind. He makes general remarks about how we are to apply so-called morphodynamics 
to literature, but especially science and philosophy, and he only intimates for the predictive uh, project. Culliano starts with a desideratum, and I quote from the preface, our modern view of history is vague and outdated. It is in need of radical revision in the light of what is occurring in the most sophisticated areas of knowledge, whose worldview started changing a hundred years ago. The discipline of history failed to join this trend. This is an embarrassing situation. As a remedy, Culliano offers his precise definition of history. I quote, history is the integrated morphodynamics of ideal objects. History is the integrated morphodynamics of ideals object. He says that only in a footnote. Well, our task then is to <coughs> specify or to elaborate what morphodynamics are or is, what e ideal objects are, and what is the argument supporting this definition. I would like to break the argument into several points. Uh, it's it starts with three empirical desiderata as applied to the particular case of Gnosticism. He tells us that, he, that his, the traditional historians of religion have failed to account first for the historical origins of Gnosticism, whether it was, for instance, a Christian heresy or it originated in pre-Christian times. Second, the historical development of Gnosticism as one school of thought or temporal succession of, doc of Gnostic doct doctrines were also not accounted for by the historians of religion. And third, they also couldn't account for the great diversity of Gnostic doctrines, which can't be subsumed under one unifying definition, a definition by invariance, as Culliano calls it. For, I quote, not all Gnostics were anti-cosmic, ancratite, that means abstainers, ascetics, or docetist, docetist, I don't know how to docetist, um, which means that Christ's body is not human but a phantasm. And not all of them believed in the demiurge of this world, or even that this world was evil, and not all of them believed in metensomatosis or reincarnation of the pre-existent soul. Okay, so this was the first step in his argument. The second one is to tell us that it appears that the Gnostics were free to believe in anything they wanted and its contrary. So studying their doctrines to look for invariance won't help us. We need to investigate instead the ways in which the Gnostics arrived at their random creeds. Therefore, Culliano suggests a paradigm shift. We need to shift the focus initially away from the historical and doctrinal questions and towards a systemic or structuralist perspective of Gnosticism. I quote, this perspective means that Gnosticism is not a monolithic doctrine, but simply a set of transformations belonging to a multidimensional variable system that allows room for illimitable, illimitable variation. He further tells us now that this system is an ideal object. It exists in its own <coughs> logical dimension. What is an ideal object? Culliano answers this in the introduction, the longer um, preliminary text in the Tree of Gnosis. And he gives, he offers us initially an analogy. The analogy is taken from a sci-fi novel by E. A. Abbott from 1884 called Flatland. And uh, the question is, what is Flatland? In a nutshell, it's a world with only two spatial dimensions plus time. Say we take the surface of a soup, and it has only two-dimensional objects in it. Say the circles of oil swimming uh, um, on, on the surface of the soup. The inhabitants of this world, flatlanders, will only have an understanding of their own world and not of three-dimensional space, of our actual space. The flatlanders perceive only lines and can move only left and right and forward and backward, not up-down. They would not be able to perceive us in, a real, in our real world. If I were to dig my spoon into the soup, the flatlanders will not perceive the soup 
sorry, would not perceive the spoon, but only a series of phenomena in time, namely, initially a small line which appears out of the blue in their world, expands, and then contracts again. That's as it were the cut, the two-dimensional cut of a three-dimensional object. The Flatlanders would have no explanation for this appearance. Only a genius Flatlander might one day make the appropriate calculations to postulate a third imperceptible dimension with objects unknown to the Flatlanders. But this higher dimension would be just a mathematical fiction, a heuristic device, as Kulian himself put it. So that was the analogy, now coming back to our real world. Similarly for us, Kulian is inspired here by Einstein, he tells us that there is a fourth dimension, however, he actually, I'm not sure he's aware that he's disagreeing or diverging from Einstein, because for Einstein, the fourth dimension is time, for Culliano, it's not time. In which, but I'll, I'll come to discuss this a bit later. So, there is a fourth dimension in which objects unknown to us exist. We can only perceive their three dimensions when they interact with our world, like my spoon, uh, when it's uh, uh, dipped into the soup. When these four-dimensional objects enter our world, we perceive them as a series of phenomena in time, like the flatlanders with the soup, or the line, rather. But this doesn't mean that these objects are a tem temporal series, just like my spoon is not really a temporal series, right? My real spoon is, is made out of metal, say. It's definitely not a temporal series. Temporal series are not made of uh, metal or, sp or, or wood or anything. The tip and end of my spoon are synchronous, right? They are within the same time frame. They exist, in fact, at the very same time. That's also contradicting Einstein, because it denies that there is synchron synchronity, absolute simultaneity, but OK, that doesn't matter for now. Now, the next step uh, by Culliano is to tell us that systems of ideas, such as Gnosticism itself, are such four-dimensional synchronous objects. He, I quote, ideas form systems that can be envisaged as ideal objects. These ideal objects cross the surface of history called time as the spoon crosses soupland, that is, in an apparently unpredictable sequence of temporal events. Culliano then tells us that this model is, uh, this model explains why historians could not make sense, uh, sorry, historians of religion could not make sense of the origins and chaotic historical development of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is to us what the spoon is to the Flatlanders. Yeah, that's the analogy. History is to us what a process of dipping the incomprehensible spoon into flatland soup. Gnosticism is a four-dimensional system of ideas, an ideal object, a logical spoon. Now the question is, however, what are systems of ideas? What is a system of ideas? Now, Culliano opposed Levi-Strauss's uh, structuralism, uh, which told us that religion codifies social relations precisely because he wanted to focus on the ideal uh, content, on, on the idea-based content of Gnosticism, unlike uh, Levi-Strauss. He also rejects Eliade's phenomenology because he can't explain historical development and it postulates inexplicable basic patterns of religion, such as the sacred and the profane, profane, axis mundi, illo tempore, etc. <coughs> By contrast, Culliano says, what we need is a model to explain the generation of the infinite, or maybe indefinite, I'm not sure, complexity of Gnostic ideas by means of simple rules. So we need to explain their logical dimension. He wants to take um, Gnostic doctrines, as it were, face value, as ideas, and not simply as consequences of the interaction between uh, human beings in society and history. Okay, well, Culliano finds, or thinks he finds, these rules in a basic trait of human existence, namely the fact that we make decisions by saying yes 
no when we are faced with, uh, with options and we have to make a decision. He gives us the example of a gangster in Chicago, that's at, towards the end of the book, who has, who has been made or was making, sometime, sometimes in the 1920s, decisions simply by flipping a coin. Heads was yes, tails was no. I hope he was not deciding about human lives that way. But we, of course, in our real world, have much more complicated decisions, uh, namely by tossing the... We can have much more complicated decisions by this, by this method, by tossing the coins twice or three times, etc. So the computational process of these decisions all follow from the binary logic of plus, minus, yes, no, or yeah, no, yes. Well, it appears now that we can explain the complexity of Gnosticism as the result of an intricate computational process based on simple rules like plus, minus. This process is random, like the gangster's coin. It starts with some random basic assumptions or options and then pro proceeds via the binary logic, um, etc. So, he, Kuliani infers from that that the Gnostic doctrines don't actually have any truth content. He explains this already in his previous book, uh, Le Gnos Dualist d'Occident, published in 1990. The Tree of Gnosis is a rewritten and thoroughly revised version of that book. And, uh, and Kuliano tells us that the doc Gnostic doctrines are just results of so-called mind games played by the Gnostics. I will quote, The main theological debates that led to the establishment of Christian doctrines were my, of, of, sorry, of the Orthodox Christian doctrine were mind games played by people with one another for centuries. Mind games not unlike chess, only perhaps less complex, which would not have had any consequences for the parties involved and could not be won unlike chess. Yet they nevertheless accomplished the moral and physical destruction of many human beings. Like Western dualism, likewise, sorry, likewise, Western dualism was a mind game. So he's applying this whole mind game theory not just to Gnosticism and dualism in general, but even to questions within Christian theology. And he tells us, uh, so unquote, he tells us that the physical destruction only came about because the game of Gnosticism interfered with another game, the game of power, which is an altogether different game. But in principle, it didn't have to. It's just a nice, beautiful game, has no truth content whatsoever. Why would you want to kill anybody for playing chess, the game of Gnosticism? Okay, so to give you an example uh, concerning Christology, not uh, Gnosticism, this is on the handout, illustration from page, the tab table uh, from page 15. Uh, I will discuss this in a second, so he, that's just a, giving you the basic structure or skeleton of the binary um, decisions which, <coughs> or rules even maybe, which generate, generated the abstract ideal object called Gnosticism by, by uh, uh, Kulian. Okay, what does he tell us about this particular table? He tells us Christology, if interpreted as a viable whole, is not a succession of anarchic, unrelated events in time, but a system made of binary switches that, much like the spoon in, sp in soupland, crosses time in an unpredictable sequence. Ideal objects exist in their own logical space, and their morphodynamics is the correct approach to the comprehensive understanding of history." Unquote. Of course, the descriptions of these ideal objects gives us only morphology, doesn't give us yet morphodynamics. Right? You need a dynamical element. And to get to history, we need to have, of course, the dynamical part. So what we need to do is we need to integrate the descriptions of these, <coughs> of these uh, ideal objects into a dynamic process of extraordinary proportions that is the temporal interaction of such systems, a process with an infinite number of dimensions. I just quoted again from the preface. And this will then give us ultimately 
morphodynamics, the study of events in time. The final conclusion he draws uh, towards the end of the book, the grand claim, as it were, is that with complex data at hand, I'm quoting, we should be able to demonstrate that portions of the map of the Buddhist system would overlap with portions of the Christian system, with portions of German idealism, with portions of modern scientific thought, because all systems are infinite and tend to explore all possibilities given to them. Accordingly, when sufficiently extended, their maps of reality would certainly coincide." Unquote. Okay, so this, was, this ends my uh, pure descriptive presentation of Kulianus' theory and argument. So now I will offer um, eight critical remarks as quickly as possible, because I'm probably running out of time. I don't know how much time. Uh, five minutes. Okay, well, I have eight <coughs> remarks. <to make. laughs> Let's see. Uh, okay, thank you. I I will hurry up. Thank yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so my first remark concerns um, Julianus' philosophical sources. Given that he is presenting here philosophical theory about the human mind, in fact, history too, we want to check him up on that. Where is he getting all his claims from? Well, he doesn't actually quote or refer to any actual history, uh, sorry, any actual philosopher, any important philosopher, whether be that in the continental or the, or the analytical tradition, Anglo-Saxon Anglo tradition. And I find this a bit puzzling because both traditions were quite rich in reflections on the nature of history. We had, for instance, Hegel and Heidegger in the continental tradition, and we had Arthur Sidanto, uh, Charles Taylor, and V. H. Walsh in the analytical tradition. And what's also curious is that within the Anglo-Saxon analytical tradition, there was a very intense debate about the nature uh, of history within philosophy in the 1960s to 80s, so precisely during the period of Kuliano's intellectual formation. But <coughs> I, I can't explain how he missed it, or, or that he ignores it at least. Another, uh, so, so what are then his uh, credentials, his philosophical sources? One is a guy called Rudy Rucker, a popular science and sci-fi author and inventor of so-called cyberpunk, which <laughs> I didn't read his books, to be honest. I only found some quotations by him, and they were bad enough. For instance, here's one quotation. Set theory is indeed the science of the mindscape. A set is the form of a possible thought, or the world can be resolved into digital bits with each bit made of smaller bits, etc., and so on. So, um, to my view, unfortunately, mumbo jumbo. And another, another philosophical source he seems to rely upon but doesn't much talk about is uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, the mathematician, uh, and uh, Darcy Thompson, the mathematical biologist. However, unlike those two, well, mathematicians in the end, Culliano never gives us really equations of any kind, and certainly not of the complexity uh, offered by Mandelbrot and <coughs> Thompson. So um, here I'm simply a bit uncertain what, what to make with, about his metaphorical references to Mandelbrot and, and Thompson um, if he's not delivering the actual goods, which is the equations. That's by, by what you, you decide whether um, uh, a mathematical theory is, uh, is correct or not. Okay. So this was the, my first remark. My second remark concerns his method, relates to the first remark. It seems that his method consists in analogy, in <coughs> pointing in an analogous manner to other disciplines which prima facie have nothing whatsoever to do with the history of religions or with humanistic disciplines in principle. And those religions, uh, sorry, <laughs> those disciplines are biology and mathematics. Now, that is a bit we strange because it means that he, the history of religion as a humanistic discipline does not have a sui generis subject matter and method anymore. 
and of course now I am not a historian of religion, so I can only make this as a caveat. In my view, it's rather ironical that Culliano, being the greatest, most important pupil of Eliade, came to such a conclusion, because Eliade himself, being probably the greatest historian of religions, sought to establish his discipline on sui generis grounds, in opposition to reductionist and scientific interpretations of religion. And he was only to be succeeded by a pupil who attempted to define this discipline as a sub-branch of mathematical biology, fractal theory, and popularized and distorted fragments of mathematics a la Rudy Rucker. So, I personally am more a fan of Eliade here than of Culliano. Okay. So we might have to go back to Eliade, or at least look very carefully at the relation between the two of them. <coughs> My third point, um, now it's becoming a, bit, a little bit more philosophical, concerns a, a circularity problem <coughs> in Culliano's theory. If it is true that all systems of ideas are just generated by mind games, by mind games we play, and if each doctrine generated by such a game is neither true nor false, then Culliano's own doctrine that all systems of ideas are just generated by mind games we play is neither true nor false, but generated by another mind game. This is especially true if Culliano thinks he has offered us a philosophical analysis of the mind. So I think this problem leads to a, a very blatant self-contradiction. And yeah, I, I'm open to, to suggestions to remedy this. My fourth remark concerns the question of truth. And this I'll break down into several points. First of all, it seems to me there is an unclarity about Culliano's analogy with, a, with the Chicago gangster. It's true that I can devise a code which represents, say, our, our alphabet by, you know, simple elementary signs plus minus, say. And it's also true that then I can rewrite, say, uh, Kant's critique of pure re reason in this code. Yeah? It's trivial. Of course we can do that. But it, or, or, or Newton's Principia Mathematica, if you want. But it doesn't follow from that that the question of the truth of Kant's propositions in the Critique of Pure Reason on in Newton's Principia Mathematica will be affected by this codified writing. Okay, the problem about truth here and the analogy of the Gensler. My second point, my second point concerning truth is Culliano says Gnostics were free to believe in anything they wanted and in its contrary. But of course, the truth is not at the same time and not the same Gnostic at the same time. So it seems to me that's just wrong. It, I mean, it's not true that each Gnostic believed everything and its contrary at the same time. It's a fallacy. So Culliano infers from the randomness, diversity, and incompatibility of all Gnostic doctrines to their lack of truth. And that doesn't seem right. Good. My third point concerning truth. Culliano effectively ignores the question of the truth of Gnostic doctrines and, in general, the truth of doctrines or proposition. He gives us, at best, a rule to generate doctrines and a possible explanation how Gnostics, philosophers, scientists, arrived at their doctrines, almost psychologically how they arrived at them. But this doesn't mean that the doctrines in question have no truth content and can't be accordingly evaluated. He confuses the origin or generation of a doctrine with the logical question of its truth. Again, I have to bring in Eliade, his, his teacher. Eliade had insisted on this point, on the distinction between the origin and generation of a doctrine and, and, its, and its, its truth or validity, it's in fact a Husserlian distinction and Fregean distinction. Many, many philosophers make this distinction. So Eliade insisted on this distinction since his earliest years. If you go back to his Romanian essays, his earliest Romanian essays on the study of the history of religions in uh, Soliloquia, for instance, Soliloquy, uh, 
for instance, he makes this point. Um, also, personally, I think it's quite likely that even as a factual description of how the Gnostics arrived at their doctrines, Culliano is not correct. Um, I mean, I certainly know that he's wrong about philosophy. The great philosophers did not toss any coins when they came to their propositions. That's just absurd. They engaged in arguments and reasoning with their predecessors. Okay, so Culliano seems, however, to have... Okay, good, so that, that was the, um, the final point. Now, something to defend him on the question of truth. He seems, however, occasionally to intimate that he does have a notion of truth or correctness. Uh, it's, however, unfortunately, it is Nietzsche or postmodern. Uh, it equates truth or correctness with power. And uh, he gives us the following criterion for the correctness or wrongness of a, of a result generated by, by uh, mind games. I quote, life is a multiple choice mechanism, myth too, and in myth, as in life, the wrong choice can be deadly. It proved indeed deadly for many innumerable Gnostics. It seems astonishing that so much blood was shed for so little." Unquote. So he's telling us actually some choices are more correct than others and some are worse than others. But of course, why were some choices worse than others? Because they interfered with the power game. So the connection between truth uh, uh, and, and reality is via power. Okay, and I, I do think that Nietzsche's account of truth is one of the most appealing you'll find in the philosophical literature on truth. My fifth point, now moving away from truth, is a certain unclarity about his analogy to flatland and Einstein's four dimensions. Culliano calls ideal objects mathematical fictions and he calls them a heuristic device. He may well be right about that, I don't know. But then he can't tell us that Gnosticism or history in general is an ideal object if he has just told us that ideal objects are mere mathematical fictions and heuristic devices. So that's just an unclarity. Maybe I misunderstood something about his argument. And now to my final three points. He's telling us, I quote, that the ideal objects cross the surface of history called time as the spoon crosses soupland, enters soupland. Now, I think there is a problem here. Time is not just part of the three-dimensional world, right? If Gnosticism is an ideal model that crosses the surface of so-called history, which is called time, according to himself, I think he's not correct about it because time is not just a, a dimension of our physical universe. In fact, it is a dimension in Flatland, even according to Abbott, uh, because things happen in Flatland too, right? It's just that they happen, they happen in two dimensions. And time is also a dimension in Culliano's own four-dimensional world. Why? Because the ideal objects seem to have a temporal dimension, right? They enter our three-dimensional world. That's talking about movement. Okay. Uh, and, okay, to my last point, two points. And so the analogy of flatland is unclear. In flatland, the third dimension is inaccessible. But for us, studying Gnosticism, there is no inaccessible fourth of, or fifth dimension. I really don't see his point here. I don't see what we are missing when we are studying the, do the, the doctrines uh, of Gnosticism. What is this imperceptible, unknowable, or... or um, aspect of Gnosticism. In fact, he has given us himself two-dimensional representations of, the, of their doctrines. So consider the following argument. We represent a historical event, take the Second World War, in two dimensions, right? We can do that. I could draw this on the board, start with 1939 and finish with 1945, and, and show you all the events uh, in, in two dimensions. Now, that's unproblematic. We the representation, the two-dimensional representation of the Second World War doesn't prove anything about the event of the Second World War being a simultaneous, non-temporal, ideal 
object existing in another imperceptible four dimension. That's simply wrong. He got here the logic of representation wrong. I think it goes very deep, this, this, uh, this mistake he made. And in fact, this is all Kuliano himself has done. He has given us a two-dimensional representation of the logical semantical relations between Christical, Christological uh, doctrines uh, here on, in this diagram or, or Gnosticism, Gnostic doctrines in the entire book. It doesn't show that Gnosticism was not a historical movement with doctrines held and defended by real historical people. In fact, Culliano himself admits implicitly the temporal dimension of Gnosticism, since he ascribes movement to the Gnostic spoon, to the ideal object. Just like the soup spoon in the flatland analogy needs to be moved by me to enter flatland. So it appears that he hasn't given us an explanation or a precise radical new definition of history. Rather, he has presupposed history as the process of the spoon, the, the gnostic spoon, moving in and out of the soup called our real world. And the last problem is one is a, is a more technical logical problem with table on page 15. Uh, it doesn't seem to me obvious that, strictly speaking, all the relations involved there are binary. And anyway, what does he mean by binary? Does he mean by that what logicians call contradictory? If you have two propositions, one must be true, one must be false. Example is it is raining or it is not raining, right? One must be true, one must be false. Or does it mean by binary relations, contrary relations, when you have two propositions which both can be true at the same time? An example would be my hat is green versus my hat is blue, right? They can't be both true at the same time, but one might be false. Whereas if a contradictory proposition, one, can't, one must be true, one must be false. Okay, etc. So, quickly my conclusion. I'm not so sure that he has, he has given us a precise scientific definition of history. If there is such a thing, why should we think there is such a thing? Um, but he has redefined it in a very narrow sense and maybe not in a very helpful sense. And to, to end on a, on a more positive note, however, I do think he has created something positive, namely another myth, a very beautiful, up-to-date myth about Gnosticism as, as an ideal object. So I would, I would like to conclude um, about him by quoting Wittgenstein's analysis of Freud, or Wittgenstein's interpretation of Freud. Take Freud's view that anxiety is always a repetition in some way of the anxiety we felt at birth. Freud does not establish this by reference to evidence for he could not do so. But it is an idea which has the attraction which mythological explanations have. Explanations, explanations which say that this is all repetition of something that has happened before. Thank you.